Thank you for joining us for the third session of our new Coker Value Path mini webinar series. It's a privilege to have you join us. Our topic today is finance and contracting. Hopefully you all got a chance to pre-submit your questions, but if not, you can submit your questions to me via email at sburnett at cokergroup.com after the presentation and we will answer your questions. If you have questions related to future topics in this series, please be sure to submit your questions to me prior to those sessions. After today's presentation, if you would like more information on the topics discussed and how they affect your organization specifically, please reach out to me directly and we will coordinate a time for you to speak with one of our associates. The participant phone line will be muted for today's presentation and the materials will be emailed to you shortly after the presentation. The slides are available to download as a handout in the GoToMeeting dashboard as well as the slide deck from previous presentations. Uh, recordings are also available upon request if you missed previous sessions. Finally, as you exit the webinar, a brief survey will pop up and we would greatly appreciate your feedback on this presentation. Today's discussion will be led by Justin Shambly, Senior Vice President, and Mark Reibel, Senior Vice President. Please join me in welcoming Justin and Mark. Thanks, Savannah. It's great to be with, uh, with everyone today. As uh, Savannah noted, this is uh, part three in uh, a, a mini webinar series that we are putting on on Value Path and really focusing on that movement from volume to value. And uh, purposefully, the, the period of time we'll, we'll be together today is limited. Uh, so by, by far, we cannot cover all of the content that we would like to in, in terms of talking about finance and contracting in the context of uh, the movement from volume to value. So really what we're going to focus on today is some of the big picture trends that we see going on in the industry leading to this, this uh, value-based reimbursement movement and then specifically focusing in on how that is impacting the what I'll call the physician compensation contracting piece of the equation in terms of aligning compensation strategies with uh, how the the, the, the reimbursement market is, is moving. So I'll let Mark uh, dive in and, and lead us through some of the, the initial slides, really sort of setting the stage for why we're, we're talking about uh, what we're talking about, and, and then uh, I'll dive in and talk about the, uh, the comp piece uh, here, here in a few moments. So Mark, go for it. Yeah, thank you. And, and I'll just echo uh, Justin and Savannah's comments about uh, just really glad to be here today talking to you all. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are going to jump right in. So, um, you know, again, we may, it may seem like we're breezing through some of this information. We are purposefully, but uh, we are also available to, uh, you know, have any follow-up discussions or answer any questions you may have. Um, just as kind of a, a tee up to, to the discussion and, and what we're talking about, some of the context here, um, I think it, it's helpful to look at, uh, you know, as we're looking forward to also take a step back and look back a little bit. So if you if you look at the last five to seven years or so, and and the uh, the healthcare provider market, um, obviously a, a lot's happened, a lot's continuing to happen today, um, and and will continue that way, I think, for the foreseeable future. But certainly some of the things that have have captured the last few years, um, we know uh, when we've talked about alignment, consolidation. Um, we use terms like strength in numbers where you are seeing this consolidation between hospitals, between physicians, hospitals and physicians, um, just generally captured as, as this, this concept of alignment. And, uh, you know, I, I think the, the key here, though, is what we've seen, what we have been seeing and have been doing and as, as we're working to uh, increase market share, expand market share. Uh, for provider organizations is really this, this move towards creating critical mass. Um, so if the last five or so years have been about creating that critical mass, then we look at um, definitely what's going, what's really starting to take hold now and, and for the next few years at least um, is now we're talking about what to do now that we've created that critical mass or what, to, what, what do we do after we've uh, really pursued and implemented some of these alignment strategies, and that really gets into this concept of integration. So we got to do something um, after consolidation, whether it's working towards uh, gaining efficiencies, um, reducing costs, uh, operations, financial uh, strategies, things like that. 
um, you know, what are some of the best practices as it relates to collaboration and, and um, sharing of resources, sharing experience. Um, and then I, you're going to hear us talk a lot today about quality and the role that quality is starting to play in this, as Justin alluded to, this shift from volume to value. Um, and, and really the target here, it all boils down to enhancing that patient experience. So as we, as we jump on, um, I'm sure all of you are familiar with or at least have heard uh, some degree of discussion about some of the, the key things that are happening as it relates to integration. Um, you know, MACRA and MITS, uh, the, 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 the current or upcoming policies and legislation and, 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 uh, and, and new laws coming down the pike here, not long at all, um, really moving towards alternative payment models. We're going to, again, talk more about that today. Um, and then, you know, some of the things that we have been doing, like shared savings or, you know, there's already a, a significant uh, a degree of progress made as it relates to bundled payments or we're seeing the development and growth of patient-centered medical home programs and, and that concept um, that have really kind of come out of the, the ACO uh, dynamic that's happened in the last few years. Uh, I'm going to jump ahead here so that we can stay on time. Um, but as we talked about some of these alternative payment models, uh, really that is one of the undoubtedly biggest um, shifts or changes that we're seeing um, from as we shift from volume to value is in the payment models that, that come down for physicians, whether it's a hospital uh, contract or um, it's even in the private group scenario. These are all becoming more and more relevant. So again, things like global payments, shared savings, bundled payments, value-based purchasing or value-based contracting, um, pay for performance or pay for quality, um, and then, you know, we all are familiar with the, the traditional fee-for-service uh, model. Um, you know, none of these, I think, are, are what we're talking about today or we're talking about anything going away. It truly is kind of a, an evolution that we're talking about or, or evolve, evolving, uh, uh, you know, steps towards this overall shift. And, and the, the biggest thing we're talking about here is, is risk, I think, and, and as we think about risk shifting on more so onto the providers, um, I, one of the key things, one of the key takeaways, I think, is, is to really highlight the fact that, you know, as risk is shifting, the incentive structures by which um, uh, physician payments are based also need to shift. And uh, again, we're going to talk more about that and what that really looks like. But under any of these new arrangements that are either out there or they're continuing to come down and, and, and be adopted, um, that's going to be a reoccurring theme. Um, so let's talk just quickly about MACRA. MACRA is the one piece of legislation um, that, uh, or, or policy, uh, government policy that has come down. Um, this, the big thing here that, you know, MACRA highlights is uh, establishing APMs or alternative payment models. So this really kind of sets the tone or paves the way for some of these um, new models that are that are being developed or, or adopted. Um, you know, I think uh, this ties in probably even more so as we get on to talk about MITS. And MITS is really um, becoming more uh, of an of a important topic for, as we're talking to clients and we're talking to whether it's health systems or, or physician-owned entities out there today, um, what, you know, the big question is, what, what do we do to get ready for macro and MITS? Um, I think everybody's heard the, the fact that um, macro and MITS really, the, these initiatives are starting to kick off as of January 2017. However, as you can see, MITS technically doesn't start until 2019. Um, that being said, um, as it relates to MITS, uh, this is by no means to, uh, you know, we want you to think that MITS replaces fee-for-service. The traditional um, fee-for-service uh, isn't going away. Um, it certainly is changing and the, as the impetus becomes and the focus really shifts more towards quality, um, it's not that fee-for-service is going away, it's just that um, how much, um, you know, how much physicians are ultimately being paid under these programs is going to be impacted by some of the key um, 
key components or key variables that are highlighted in MITS. And, and uh, the other piece here, um, again, even though we're talking about you know, this, this not being truly starting in place, being implemented until 2019, uh, 2017 is still absolutely relevant here because um, the data for which, on which the 2019 payments will start will actually be based reverting back to data starting in 2017. So for all intents and purposes, as far as physicians should be concerned, 2017 is when this starts, just the payment models won't entirely shift until 19. So um, it's absolutely something that's relevant to talk about. It's something relevant to, uh, to be planning for today, literally, because we're less than six months away now. From, from this beginning, uh, but uh, the, obviously as with everything else, the devil's in the details, and, and that's where we get into some of these models and get into some of the specific compensation arrangements that really, that really are going to uh, take place under these models. So I'm going to let Justin dive into a little bit more detail as far as that goes. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Mark. And, and uh, as Mark alluded to, I mean, the, the, the reimbursement market is truly changing, whether you're in an ACO or CIN or, or just, uh, uh, you know, going with the flow relative to fee-for-service reimbursement in your market. I mean, the MIPS program is, is somewhat a, of a game changer because regardless of other activity, it is forcing organizations to start thinking about value because ultimately, as uh, Mark highlighted, the MIPS program is going to affect reimbursement based on that quality component, and, and so it's extremely important. And one of the key things that we're focused on with respect to the overall value path initiative is aligning incentives, meaning if we want a physician to change their behavior such that uh, they're doing something different than, than they have in the past, we need to change the incentive structures to align the incentives with those behavioral changes that we want, meaning if our reimbursement market continues to change, our compensation strategies need to change alongside with those. And, and that's really what we want to talk about through the rest of the, the, the session here today. If you look at market data, this is from uh, one of the more recent MGMA physician comp surveys, uh, the market truly is changing. Uh, the, this survey indicated that 11% of total compensation for primary care physicians was tied to quality, slightly less uh, at around 7.5% for specialty care, but still that's a huge increase from where it was just a couple of years prior. The other interesting statistic is looking at the number of groups reporting that 100% of their comp was productivity-based. Uh, that has, has decreased precipitously as well, so you can truly see in the market there is a change occurring relative to compensation structures adapting to be more value-based than purely volume-based. Another stat that's a, a little bit old but I think is still extremely relevant based on our day-to-day -day experiences is that the useful shelf life of physician compensation arrangements is pretty limited right now. And that makes sense just because of how volatile the compensation or the, the, the uh, reimbursement realm is, meaning uh, we've, we've got to have compensation strategies that are somewhat nimble relative to the reimbursement structure, because if we stay stagnant in a fee-for-service comp strategy, but our reimbursement is continuing to be uh, value-based, we're going to have a misalignment there, and it will ultimately affect performance for the health system or the, the medical practice, whichever it may be. So uh, models have a limited shelf life. They're, they're continuing to change as the reimbursement market changes. And other stats, uh, such as the Merritt-Hawkins survey, just to highlight the fact that uh, the, the, the focus on quality as it, as it relates to an incentive structure continues to grow as well. And one of the things that we, we see first and foremost relative to performance or value-based incentives and comp strategies is that the focus has truly changed, meaning five years ago there may have been, I'll say, quote, quality incentives in a comp model, but they were really more so citizenship type focuses, or citizenship focused, meaning did you get your, your, your charts completed, did you attend a meeting, things akin to that. And what we found is health systems are saying, look, you know, these are the minimum work standards that we expect of an employee doctor. We're not going to incentivize for those anymore. Those are just uh, expected. And so we're going to take these dollars and focus on true value adds going forward to the extent that we have the data to support them. And that's been a, a key change 
and, and it's largely driven by an, the, the changes in the market. And, and a lot of the funding for these changes are, are coming from third-party payers, meaning in, in many markets we see the Blues or Aetna or United, whoever it may be, coming to health systems and saying, look, if you'll partner with us on X, whether it be a patient-centered medical home initiative or you know, better documentation so we have a better sense of how sick our patients are, whatever it may be, you know, they will provide additional compensation or reimbursement to the organization for those things. Of course, Medicare and, and their various programs have been around, distributions from ACOs and, and clinical integrated networks are on the rise. And, and for more than anything else, we see health systems saying, look, you know, we are willing to ante up relative to the quality metrics, or we're willing to realign some of the current compensation that is purely production-based and put it into value-based endeavors because that is a core focus going forward. So, so how these performance incentives are funded can come from various sources, but the key is that they are, are becoming more predominant, whether that is internally funded or externally funded. What we also see, and this is highlighted on a, a, uh, a different slide, is the value within the overall compensation structure can vary as it relates to the quality or performance metrics, meaning right now we see much more of a focus in the primary care realm relative to performance versus specialty care, because really a lot of the activity in the market right now is primary care based, meaning you know, let's establish that, that uh, care management protocols. Let's have the primary care physician being the gatekeeper. Uh, let's have them truly manage the care of a population. And once we get that down, we can start focusing on other specialty care initiatives. And that doesn't mean that there's no activity in the specialty care realm. There still is a lot. Uh, you think about Medicare's uh, joint replacement bundle payment pilot uh, and, and cardiology bundles that have been talked about and, and other others that into that. Uh, you know, lots of activity in the co-management space for specialty care. So there's there's things going on in the specialty care, specialty care realm, but it's much more so uh, focused in a few key areas versus being sort of this overarching premise that uh, primary care is is focused on driving the value. And it goes without saying that there is a lot of challenges that come into implementing performance-based incentives in any environment, one of those being the ability to capture data. Productivity-based compensation arrangements are easy because, in essence, we're just polling or, 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 or pursuing data in a system relative to a single production metric, whereas with performance incentives, I mean, we're talking about various quality metrics, patient satisfaction metrics, perhaps uh, readmission metrics, length of stay metrics. I mean, it, it can, can uh, the, the number of metrics, especially when you multiply it by a number of specialties, can become quite voluminous. And so uh, the ability to capture good data, to report on it timely, for it to be accurate, it becomes a, a huge challenge, and it's one of the things that we see health systems and medical practices struggling with is, you know, how do we capture the data that we need to support what we want to do in a performance realm? And I, I per perceive that this will continue to be a challenge for many years to come, because what we find right now is a lot of the focus is on more so process-based metrics. You know, did you do this? Did you do that? And I think the question that a lot of physicians have, at least in, in my speaking with them, is, you know, is this truly quality? You know, or is it more so just, you know, my nurse doing something? And so I think the, the focus of these is going to have to continue to evolve to be really much more substantial than they are now for there to be buy-in. And, of course, for that to occur, we've got to have data. I'm not going to go through each of these, but obviously there's a number of other challenges as well, but it all centers around the data, you know, the accuracy, objectivity, applicability, uh, and all those, those things surrounding the, the data that is used in the performance realm. So a couple of key tenets for establishing these. Uh, determine what you want to, tra to incentivize. This is very different than saying, okay, what are we tracking now, and let's limit our, ourselves to using that. I always focus on more so what is the, the, the best uh, 
practices? You know, what are the things that we want to incentivize? And then going and saying, okay, can we track that? Are we tracking it? You know, what do we need to do to track that? And so not limiting ourselves to, you know, just the, the, the basic PQRS metrics that we may be tracking now. So really pursuing what, what truly adds value. Another key thing that we focus on is, is balancing the metrics that you're focused on and the, the value of the incentive, meaning we don't want to have a $50,000 incentive that's only tied to one process-based quality metric, but at the same time we don't want a $5,000 incentive that's tied to 50 different metrics. So we've got to make sure that there's some level of alignment between the value of the incentive and the associated metrics. Collaboration is also key, meaning uh, it shouldn't be the health system or, or sitting in a room saying, okay, what do we want to incentivize? Uh, the, the, the key stakeholders need to be in the same room looking at key areas of opportunity and honing in on metrics that address those areas of opportunity. So it, it should truly be a collaborative process. And another thing that, that we highlight a lot that I think uh, is, is extremely important is Understanding that when monies start coming in from external sources, whether it be a third-party payer, a distribution from an ACO, these don't oftentimes equate to a direct pass-through of compensation. Meaning if Blue Cross says, look, we're going to pay each physician you know, $8,000 uh, for, for pursuing X initiative. Well, that's great, but I view that as a new revenue stream, not a new compensation stream, meaning those should be seen as, as additional reimbursement, similar to fee-for-service reimbursement, because if we establish the, the expectation that any new monies tied to, quote, value-based programs is a pass-through of compensation, you know, ultimately these are going to replace our fee-for-service reimbursement and we will have set the precedent that 100% of those dollars coming in should go directly out as compensation. And we will have no monies to fund the infrastructure of our organization. So I always highlight the fact that new money should be viewed as revenue, not compensation. So they should be viewed as funding mechanisms for the overall program, meaning paying for compensation, but also all the overhead uh, that, that goes into running a medical practice versus simply a pass-through of compensation. So boiling all of this down, it, it, sometimes I, I think the idea of moving down this value-based reimbursement path or value path can be overwhelming. And so what I try to do is just highlight a few key questions that I think organizations should be asking themselves now and and based on those answers uh, acting upon you know what what the next steps are so a couple of these just to highlight uh, you know is our compensation methodology meaning how we're paying our physicians aligned with the organization's mission values vision etc because if they aren't there's a huge misalignment there meaning we're asking our physicians to do one thing but we're trying as an organization to do a different thing. And you're going to really have a hard time driving towards your mission, vision, and values if the incentives with key stakeholders is not aligned. Similarly, is our compensation methodology aligned with our reimbursement structure? A great example of this is an organization I was working with a few years ago that, that said, you know, we want to put in a pure panel-based compensation arrangement for our primary care doctors. And I said, that's great. You know, we can definitely help with that. Let's talk a little bit about your reimbursement structure. You know, what does that look like right now? And the feedback was, we're 100% or, you know, at least very close, still fee-for-service. And my initial, you know, response was, well, then you probably don't want to go to a pure panel-based comp strategy because the incentives will be too misaligned. You know, do we want to start adding in some incentives relative to panel? Ah, yeah, that, that would make a lot of sense. But purely a panel-based incentive structure, you know, may not help the organization in the short term because that's not how you're being reimbursed. So, you know, looking at the alignment and, and saying, okay, are we moving – in lockstep or at least close with our reimbursement structure I think is a key question. And along these same lines, you know, is your comp structure nimble? 
meaning if our reimbursement structure continues to tweak itself over the next few years in, in small increments, are we going to have to step back and redesign our comp structure each year in order to be successful? And I, I think that would be an overwhelming task. And so my goal is always creating comp structures that can move in lockstep with the reimbursement structure. So meaning that they have some level of nimbleness such that we don't have to go back to the drawing board every time there's a change in reimbursement. You know, other questions, and I won't uh, elaborate on these too much, but, uh, you know, what reimbursement changes are anticipate, anticipated? And, and am I or do I have what I need to start moving in that direction now? And then finally, you know, do I have the data? Meaning it's a great plan to put in performance-based incentive structures, but if we don't have the data to support it, we are not going to be success, successful in the long run, or at least in the short term, until we can have that data. So, you know, focusing on the data that we need to support the comp strategies we're pursuing is extremely important. And these are just a few of the questions. I mean, uh, as I said at the onset, we could go on and on and on relative to uh, what's going on in the physician compensation realm, but I, I hope this provides a, a quick, quick intro as to some of the things that, that we are seeing. And I think it just highlights, uh, you know, what, what we want to highlight real quick, which is sort of what we are doing from a, uh, a Coker Group standpoint with respect to the volume to value realm. I mean, we are very active in this space in a, uh, in a variety of areas, but one of the things that we've found is this whole process can be so overwhelming to health systems, medical practices, whatever it may be, that oftentimes they, they just need to step back and say, okay, what are we truly trying to accomplish with respect to this? You know, what, what pieces do we need to put into place to have a true strategy as we move from volume to value, or at least somewhat down that pathway. And, and that's where the, the whole idea of Coker value path assessments comes into place. And really what this does is tries to look at all the different areas of focus that come into play as we move from volume to value, talking about uh, what, what we talked about today, meaning the alignment of incentive structures. You know, what, what technology needs do you have? Uh, risk management in terms of uh, uh, your self-insured population and, and secondary insurance to support some of the things that you may be doing in, in terms of taking risk on a population of health patients. Uh, you know, how you're aligning or, or truly integrating your medical group into uh, these initiatives. And then, you know, getting even more into the care process design, meaning what are you doing on the hospital-based side to truly uh, understand the costs that are going into processes you know, day-to-day -day activities, meaning the management of a cath lab or uh, joint replacement programs. You know, what are the costs going in, in there and what costs can be reduced such that we can, you know, deliver a higher quality experience at a lower cost to, to our patients. And so one of the things that we really try to do is outline sort of the key areas that uh, health systems are strong in these realms uh, and, and where there's room to grow. And our assessments are really designed to help organizations make this transition and, and provide a, a roadmap as it relates to, uh, to moving down this path. Uh, some of the things that we really focus on in these is a, a comprehensive survey of your markets and, and you know, where your reimbursement strategy is heading. What we find is, is a health system in Boston is moving at a very different pace than a health system in rural New Mexico. And so the same strategy shouldn't apply uh, to both, uh, both organizations. Uh, we, we, we need a custom strategy based on where the local market is heading. So one of the things that we try to do is help an organization understand their, their local markets. And really what we ultimately provide is, is both written and verbal outlines or reports basically outlining the specific steps that organizations should take to move down this pathway, which, uh, you know, is very custom, custom driven because of, of the needs being very custom based. And, and so obviously, you know, we feel like we, we have a lot to offer in this realm. And, and really, if there's anything relative to, to this conversation that's piqued your interest or uh, any of the other WebExes that we've provided 
to date or the ones that are coming, Coker would love to be of assistance to you and, and really help ease some of the, uh, the, the concerns or the uh, just uh, hesitation that comes with this, this pathway that we find ourselves in and really offer our assistance in helping you move down, down that uh, volume to value uh, pathway. So uh, with that, uh, I'll, I'll pitch it back over to Savannah and uh, she can wrap it up. But, but as she said, any, any key questions that you have, feel free to reach out to Mark or I or, you know, most importantly, reach out to our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Nye, who, who is really spearheading the Value Path initiatives and, and we'd love a chance to, to chat with you. So Savannah, why don't you close us out? Thank you, Justin and Mark. Um, like you said, if you have further questions or are interested in further discussion, you can reach out to me or to Justin and Mark, um, and we'll coordinate that. Um, again, we'd appreciate your feedback as you ep exit this webinar, and we look forward to having you with us for our next session in two weeks on the topic of care process design system. Thank you.